Thank you, um, Dean uh, Milton Curry, uh, for the invitation and uh, kind introduction. Uh, thank you to Alison Hirsch and uh, Alex Robinson for extending this uh, invitation for me to visit uh, USC and uh, share some of my work with you. Uh, it's so fabulous to see uh, colleagues, uh, old friends um, from far and long ago, uh, from a galaxy far, far away. Um, and it's a pleasure to uh, spend the evening uh, with you all uh, tonight. Um, I was really thrilled to uh, receive the invitation and, uh, and uh, with the theme on technology as uh, Dean Curry uh, described, uh, I've been thinking about this for quite some time and uh, wanted to uh, uh, share with you the kind of the most recent thinking I've been doing uh, on the work that I've been doing for the last uh, decade or so. Um, in a sector or in a, in a area of research uh, that's largely dubbed uh, living green infrastructure. And so the title of today's uh, tonight's lecture is Landscape as Technology uh, or Landscape Technology, Living uh, Green Infrastructure. Um, and the kind of the question that I start with uh, and, and what I've been thinking about with my own work is uh, what are the ways uh, that I could develop uh, empirical, uh, experimental, and engaged research practices on green infrastructure and sustainability action in an academic institution? So that's the kind of the, the framing for this, this evening's talk. Um, and I've also been reflecting and wanted to put a kind of a maybe a, a sort of a theoretical framework for, for uh, tonight's talk in terms of thinking about uh, how we might think about landscape technology or landscape as technology. What does that mean? And I begin with these kind of two uh, cautionary tales. Uh, one, two, two, of the, uh, two of these articles that were published in, in a journal issue uh, of New Geographies that comes out of uh, Harvard. And this was a, uh, an article that was written by Jean Robert, who's a historian of science. Uh, and this was largely dedicated to questions around energy and alternative energy, but he begins with this story. So I will read that to you. The editor reminded me of the title of a pamphlet I once wrote, titled Cow Dung is Not Energy. I was thinking then of an Indian villager who have no other fuel than dry cow dung. Imagine that a good do-gooder from abroad comes to a village with blueprints of a marvelous biodigester, a pop science version of a, the energy concept into a world where people have 100 words for nature's forces and gifts. If this well-intended alternative technology su succeeds in building his contraption, the villagers who can afford to pay for it will have gas in their kitchens, but the poor will have no biogas and no cow dung left. This impoverishment can rightly be said, seen as a result of the transmogrification of cow dung, a gift of a domestic goddess into an input for, for alternative industrial production energy. And I think this, uh, article particularly resonates with me in terms of framing the kind of questions around technology or particularly when we think about natural systems and our human relations to them and the uh, concept of technology um, where this is a kind of a cautionary tale around the, the positivistic hubris that we have around technology. There's a kind of a, an assumption that technology is a, is a panacea, that, that it's, a, that it's a naturally a good thing. Um, and there's also a kind of a cautionary note around the reductive approach to technology or to natural systems, that it can be extracted or reduced to a singular value. And so there's a kind of a cautionary note because today the kind of ideas around green infrastructure 
and natural systems have a value. They, are, they have an economic value. They have a kind of a scientific value in terms of the ecosystem services that they provide. The second cautionary note is around the kind of emergence of environmental performance. And with it, along, along with it, is the kind of ambiguity of metrics. Again, we assume that there's a kind of an inherent good, an inherent success, an inherent sort of uh, 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 value um, in the environmental performance of systems. Um, but the reality is that there is a lot of gaps, uh, uh, gaps between um, uh, the fallacy of metrics, the gaps between pre and post construction, uh, the limitation of standards and policies, uh, the singular view rather than the holistic approach, and the quantitative evaluation of things rather than the, uh, without the qualitative ones. Um, so along with it, in the last decade or so, there have been a, another emerging study or another research area which is looking at what's called the performance gap, the kind of idea that what we uh, assume is going to work and what actually works, there is a gap there. And that gap is actually uh, in multiple ways. It's between the projected and the actual performance, it's the disciplinary gap where we are studying things in silos. There's the sectoral gap where there's academic research, there's policy sector, there's industry, and there is no real correlation or uh, dialogue between those sectors. And there's regional. In other words, there's a kind of the cut and paste approach that if you develop a technology, particularly around living systems as it pertains to landscape architecture, that you can simply cut and paste from one region to another. In architecture, there are now many studies that are showing that, for instance, lead in, in lead buildings, there's about uh, out of, uh, let's say, I think they, they had a thousand buildings that they uh, studied, 30% underperformed, 30% hit the mark, and 30% overperformed. In other words, we only really know about 30% how well we're doing uh, when we want to know where we're, we're short and where we're actually exceeding uh, performance. And then other papers are looking at, uh, and this was a, a study at, U, at the University of British Columbia Center for Interactive Research on Sustainability, where the entire building was instrumented with about 3,000 sensors to look at where um, the, the, to evaluate the performance, the energy performance of the building, and looked at all the kind of, not only the gaps in terms of the projected and actual performance, but also between the kind of life of a building, the uh, pre, uh, the assumptions around how people would live in the building and how they would operate uh, in the building. So the, there, there, there are lots of these kinds of uh, studies that are looking at the pre and post occupancy and um, with respect to environmental performance. And so those are the kind of the two frameworks that, uh, that I've been thinking about with my own work relative to uh, green infrastructure. And the way that I came into this is when I joined uh, the University of Toronto uh, and moved to, uh, to the city in, uh, around 2009, um, the city had launched uh, its Green Roof Bylaw. And this was the first Green Roof Bylaw in North America, uh, which mandated essentially that all new construction above uh, 6,000 square feet would be implemented uh, with a green roof. And this really kind of set the tone. There were many cities that had an incentive uh, programs uh, in the United States, but uh, Toronto really kind of uh, led, uh, led uh, cities in that regard that it made it an actual legislation and requirement. Uh, most recently, uh, New York uh, followed suit and followed the Canadian example, the Toronto example for its bylaw and instituted the exact same uh, legislation for all uh, new construction and also has an in incentive program for uh, retrofitting. And so over the last uh, decade or so, 
The city of Toronto has built over 650 green roofs uh, with over uh, 5 million uh, square feet of, uh, of green roofs. And uh, the uh, upshot for uh, my research group was just to basically look at uh, how green uh, are green roofs and have we put the cart before the horse uh, without actually testing them empirically for their effectiveness? Are we, is this really just greenwashing? Uh, and meanwhile, you have, um, you know, uh, an industry that is worth uh, in the billions and a lot of materials that are actually extracted, mined, and so on, uh, processed into, into these technologies. Uh, and I always talk about the, the idea that there is really no, no free lunch, that any, any green system that you're building, uh, there are materials that are mined, uh, something has been manufactured, there's emissions that are um, emitted, uh, there are uh, transportation, uh, uh, energy, and costs, and so on. Uh, and so what are the kind of environmental benefits that we're gaining, uh, and, and how are we offsetting those environmental impacts? So shortly thereafter, after the uh, Green Roof Bylaw was instituted, uh, I received a large grant from the City of Toronto to build uh, the GRIT Lab, which stands for Green Roof Innovation Testing Laboratory. Uh, it uh, is a space that's about uh, 2,000 square feet on top of our old faculty uh, building, which um, includes uh, 33 test beds there on the left, uh, looking at different uh, material configurations, uh, green facades and vining facades uh, to look at the thermoregulatory potential of green walls on, on uh, building envelopes. And um, the first of its kind in Canada and probably one out of uh, a handful of uh, projects uh, like that worldwide is a combination of solar green roofs looking at the optimization of energy uh, performance for solar panels with the cooling impact of green roofs underneath. Um, and so this was uh, constructed over a period of, uh, of about three years with multiple grants. And what I've done is, uh, is assemble an um, interdisciplinary team of engineers, biologists, ecologists, to look at the kind of cross-cutting issues with respect to uh, to green roofs. Um, so uh, here's a, a close-up uh, or an aerial shot of, of the green roofs, and we're looking at what's called extensive green roofs, and these are less than 15 centimeters uh, or six inches, um, and the, the kind of the primary performance agenda, if you will, are stormwater management, the reduction of runoff from rooftops, um, and uh, the second is thermal cooling um, with respect to uh, urban heat island and the kind of surfaces that, we're, uh, that we have in urban environments, asphalt and concrete and, uh, and uh, 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 roof membranes. Uh, plant growth and biodiversity, how does that fit in terms of the kind of uh, uh, ecological um, aspect and looking at also at, at pollinators. And the question there was uh, which design parameters are most significant for water capture, thermal cooling, plant cover, and pollinator habitat. And I'll get into some of the details that we're uh, looking at. Um, all of our installations are always instrumented with sensor technology, so we're acquiring environmental data in real time. The second research area was uh, green facades, uh, looking at the surface cooling potential of vining facades on uh, building envelopes, and also looking at the selection of, vining, of vines and their uh, plant growth habit. Again, instrumenting with surface uh, temperature sensors, uh, on the uh, building facade. The third area is looking at uh, the integrated uh, green roof and solar photovoltaic. Um, and with a large question of 
is there, are there benefits of combining green roofs with solar photovoltaics? In, in essence, looking at climate change mitigation through renewables and climate change adaptation through flood reduction. And can you do the two? Uh, and what was happening at the time in, uh, in Ontario is that there was another incentive program that was a feed-in tariff uh, that incentivized uh, the construction of solar panels in, uh, on, on buildings. Um, and that launched an enormous industry in southern Ontario uh, for solar uh, industry. And what ensued after that was that the solar industry and the green roof industry were in competition with one, one another for the same roof area. So our study looked at the, the, the question of why either or, why not both? Uh, and we asked questions around what's the effect of uh, the cooling, uh, the temperature on energy production, given that uh, solar panels, when they're overheated, they're energy production actually drops and their lifetime also decreases. Um, and what's the effect of shading? And this is a really uh, kind of uh, perfect photo to show the kind of uh, solar shading that you would get uh, 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 for plant growth as well as shading from uh, rainfall. And what's the kind of the overall uh, water balance? So, uh, <laughs> I love this image. Uh, this was uh, the, the kind of record storm uh, in Toronto uh, in 2013, July 8th, 2013, which broke uh, what the record was for flood uh, measurements in Toronto, which was a Hurricane Hazel, 1954 Hurricane Hazel. Uh, about a uh, uh, hundred and uh, um, 26 millimeters of rainfall dumped on the city of Toronto in a period of about two hours. So this is the entire rainfall for the month of July in a period of two hours, which uh, instantaneously shut down the city, uh, $850 million in uh, damages to uh, ranging from basement flooding to environmental impacts on the Great Lakes and, and the, the kind of the water bodies uh, in Toronto. Uh, this became the kind of uh, what they call the new normal. And there was an article at the time uh, that was written by uh, in the Toronto Star and uh, by, by Christopher Hume, Hume who wrote, we face a double whammy of disaster. Not only is the city's aging infrastructure unable to cope with the load, but that load has grown heavier because of climate change. So water management has become one of the biggest uh, incentives for uh, green infrastructure and the kind of adoption of legislation, the recognition that landscape systems uh, could come in to actually augment the gray infrastructure that we have that are deeply uh, under capacity uh, once because of our urbanization, the kind of rapid growth of urban regions, but also because the storms that we're getting are much more severe and much more intense. The other aspect is not only water quantity, but also water quality. So you've got 5,400 uh, 5, hectares of roadways in Toronto, and this was a 2013 figure, uh, with uh, upwards of 5,000 hectares of impervious surfaces, pollutant concentrations and stormwater runoff of uh, over 11,000 percent greater than the province of Ontario water quality objectives during a typical 25 millimeter rainfall event. So you're talking about the idea of holding on to water on site is not only because of flooding, but really also because of quality, water quality control. And so here you're, you're looking at an aerial of, uh, of uh, the greater Toronto area, which uh, is now the fifth largest metropolitan in North America. And you can see that the kind of the corollary to this is also the urban heat island effect, which has become the second motivation for green infrastructure and the adoption of it. So water on one hand, urban heat and the kind of surfaces. You can see the in blue is the green belt, which has been one of the most successful sort of political 
um, uh, environmental protection uh, areas uh, uh, in, in history. Um, and you could see in opposite the red all the kind of the paved areas. Uh, also, what you can see are some of the kind of uh, ravine lands that are weaving through Toronto, which are the kind of the, the, the geographical imprint of the post-glacial uh, geography of, of uh, Toronto. And what you can see here is the kind of the remnants of what used to be these ecological corridors that carve through the landscape that are now only in these kind of remnant uh, and a very low ecological uh, integrity and low ecological um, uh, function. And so there's a kind of a, a confluence of motivations here. One is the water, the water management, urban heat, uh, and also the ecological loss, all of which are uh, interdependent and uh, motivating the kind of adoption to thinking about uh, living green infrastructure as, um, as uh, a, a, a set of policies within the Toronto region. Uh, and here what you're seeing is one of the ravine lands with the downtown Toronto uh, in between. And the, the concept behind green infrastructure is the fact that it's multi-scalar and multifunctional. Uh, so it operates at the scale of the of ravine lands and large parks and conservation areas, but it also then functions at the scale of uh, a building and, and architecture. Um, and uh, all the kind of the cross-cutting issues or multifunctional issues are thought about both at the kind of the micro level of materiality and how as aggregated or when aggregated, they have a macro effect on a regional scale. So as I mentioned, uh, the 2009 Green Roof Bylaw uh, was a kind of a seminal piece. It, it, it uh, leveraged a lot of research uh, funding and also uh, the, the implementation and an enormous industry in Southern Ontario. Uh, but it wasn't really uh, a, a kind of an, a standalone. It came along with a whole host of policies, regional policies in the area, from the wet weather flow management, which requires the, uh, the retention and the capture of stormwater runoff on site, um, to uh, a, a more recent strategy around the protection of Toronto's ravine lands, uh, which, as I mentioned uh, before, have become, uh, through the, the 1954 Hurricane Hazel, became protected lands and really launched the Toronto Region Conservation Authority's legal mandate to protect these ravine lands for water management. Uh, a more re another recent kind of mandate to increase uh, forest cover in Toronto from 27% uh, with 10.2 uh, million trees. And the objective to increase uh, that cover to 40%. Um, the uh, provincial official plan, uh, which for the first time integrated green infrastructure into the language, the Toronto Green Standard, which is the equivalent of the LEED building, uh, under which the Green Roof Bylaw sits, the Toronto Green Streets technical guidelines looking at retrofitting uh, streets so that they're uh, not only complete streets for, uh, for uh, uh, pedestrian and um, uh, cycle uh, mobility, but also to capture water and increase canopy cover the biodiversity guidelines for uh, green roofs, the pollinator protection strategy, and the most recent uh, biodiversity strategy for the city. And so the, the green roof legislation really sits within a kind of a suite of strategies around green infrastructure in Toronto. And the question is that, that, that we ask ourselves is whether, how, how effective are these strategies? How, uh, what, what is the kind of the difference? Are they, are they tactical or are they strategic? Are they there just to sort of say, here are the numbers, here are the quantities of implementation, or are there actually uh, the kind of the, the holistic thinking around uh, their, their uh, performance as a whole, as a kind of a suite of strategies on environmental sustainability? The 
other kind of aspect of, of what's happening in the field is also this, uh, and, and, and I alluded to that before, is this uh, kind of growing interest in quantifying the ecosystem services of natural systems. Uh, this is an article of TD Bank evaluating Toronto's tree canopy at $7 billion or 80 millions per year. Uh, also uh, uh, comparing that to the kind of uh, emissions if, 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 if that canopy uh, would be removed, uh, it, would, it would be the, the equivalent of about 19 million tons of air pollution a year. Uh, or offsetting uh, the kind of pollution created by a million cars or 100,000 uh, homes per year. So there, there's a kind of an interest in quantifying the environmental uh, uh, benefit of green systems in, in essence to justify their existence, which is both a kind of, a, uh, uh, I would say, it's a good thing in a sense that it's helping us to conserve natural systems and implement uh, constructed systems, but at the same time, a kind of a slippery slope in terms of only valuating their, um, their, val their, their kind of value, value for their, uh, their economic benefits. Uh, green roof benefits, There's a, this is a source from the Green Roof for Healthy Cities, looking at the kind of the multitude of, of benefits that one could get from aesthetic improvement to waste diversion, stormwater management, all the way to educational opportunities and so on. Um, but even then they say true, but the devil's in the details. Uh, their disclaimer say, while there are similarities among green roofs, each installation is unique, hence all technical performance details provide, uh, provided will vary by region, climate, building, and green roof type and design. These figures are provided as generic examples only and should not be used for designing projects. So hence the kind of the, the, the uh, charge that I put out earlier around, around this notion of how, um, how effective are these technologies and, uh, and the, the kind of the notion that you can't really cut and paste uh, living systems from one area to another or even from one building to the next. So this is a, the kind of the, the prelude and maybe the framework of, of, of where my work has been uh, focusing the kind of the motivation um, and the kind of the thinking of why and the criticality that why we need the criticality of looking at uh, green technologies and green infrastructure. Um, now looking more specifically at what we've actually built, uh, we looked at the green roof uh, bylaw and the construction standard um, with respect to four design factors. We were looking at the growing media composition and there was a kind of a recommendation for an aggregate, low organic content, content medium, uh, growth media, which was based on a German landscape standard and imported to North America, and is not only unique to uh, Toronto, but is uh, practiced in much larger regions uh, all across North America. The growing media depth, there was a requirement of uh, four inches, for irrigation, there was a recommendation for water conservation, and with lead, you'd get points for uh, for conserving for water conservation or for use of non-potable water. And for planting, there was a recommendation for sedum mats, which are these kind of uh, succulent uh, plants that are drought tolerant and tolerant to very sort of harsh conditions, growth conditions. Um, so uh, here are some images looking at what we were actually, uh, what I just described, the, the mineral aggregate on the left. Uh, and uh, with us, we compared it to what we found uh, to be another sort of uh, regional practice looking at wood-based compost. The difference between the two are their nutrient availability for plants. So you could see largely mineral aggregate does not have a lot of organic matter. Uh, and a biologically derived compost base has uh, 
a, a, a huge availability of nutrient capacity uh, and also water holding uh, a capacity. Uh, and you can see that in, uh, in the graph. Uh, the other thing that was, that's worth mentioning here is that the aggregate is mined uh, and it's not mined regionally, it comes from upstate New York, so transported any biologically derived is 100% recycled material looking at the kind of the cyclical uh, economy as, a, as one of the sort of the basis for material choices. The second was looking at plant communities and plant decisions. On the right is the most prevalent uh, uh, vegetation community that's specified in green roofs, and that's the, the sedum varietals. On the left is a combination of about 16 species of grasses and herbaceous plants that are native to southern Ontario. Um, and with that, we are looking at the kind of the question of native, non-native, and does that matter? The third is the supplementary irrigation, as I mentioned before, the kind of the, the dilemma on do you use water? Um, and that is a really big question, especially if you were to uh, uh, think about, about other areas where water conservation is a huge issue. Uh, so so what, what is the kind of the happy medium? We were looking at uh, daily irrigation, automated irrigation, no irrigation, which those were the two sort of standard practices. And we added a third component, a third variable, which is on-demand activated by a soil moisture sensor uh, irrigation. And this is all with uh, drip irrigation. So in summary, we had uh, four performance criteria we were looking at, stormwater management, thermal cooling, plant growth in terms of cover, uh, percent cover, uh, biomass as in the, the actual uh, three-dimensional growth or canopy, the diversity of plants, and the habitat, and then the kind of the design factors uh, in terms of the design variables and the alternatives. And what's important to mention is, uh, is the kind of the, the aspect of the, the, what's called the multifactorial experimental design. And that is something that I would say is quite unique to our laboratory because of the interdisciplinary nature of it, that we have uh, civil engineers looking at water, biologists that are looking at habitat, uh, ecologists and foresters looking at soil science and, uh, and all of that connected, looking at these kind of cross-cutting issues with all the different perform performances, which other labs are sort of looking at them as just water or just biology, just habitat and so on. We thought it was really important to look at the kind of the issues in tandem. Um, the other aspect about experimental setups that are, that are worth noting is the kind of need for replication. So you can't really have just one test bed, that you need multiple reps of things to actually make it statistically viable, and that you also want to randomize your configuration uh, to avoid what's called a block effect. So you don't have uh, something that is sort of haphazard or coincidental that happened to affect uh, the, the study. All of our beds are, uh, and, and our entire installations are instrumented with sensors. They're recording uh, these, these environmental dynamics in real time every five minutes. Um, so this is a, a, a rendering of each one of our test beds with a, a kind of an, a, a mast of uh, sensors um, that include uh, thermal sensors with radiation shields that are looking at the ambient temperature uh, above the bed, and there's a kind of a profile of, of uh, 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 temperature. Um, there is the uh, tipping bucket rain gauge that looks at the discharge of water from each bed, so we can relate that to a storm event and what's the delay of runoff, and also what's the quantity and how much was captured by the bed and then evapotranspired by the plants. Um, and this is a rendering of the uh, tipping bucket rain gauge. There's a soil moisture sensor, so we can complete that entire water balance picture. 
And then there's a weather station uh, on our roof that's recording the kind of the local climate data for solar, wind, humidity, uh, rainfall. Uh, and this is what our students spent uh, about a summer uh, doing, uh, uh, instrumenting over 500 uh, sensors with 5,000 linear feet of uh, cable uh, and, and uh, try to program all the kind of uh, uh, sensors to, to uh, allow us to record the real-time data. Um, what did we find in terms of the, the kind of the, uh, some of the, the primary findings that, that, that I'd like to share with you? Uh, in terms of the primary industry practices, the mineral aggregate, the sedum plants, um, and the either the daily irrigation or no irrigation proved to be the most common, about 90% of installations in Toronto were of this kind. And I would say it's probably the same for a lot of other uh, urban regions. Um, and what we found was actually that the organic media the, uh, was far superior in terms of uh, the kind of performance that we were looking for. Uh, irrigation was the most significant factor for all performance criteria, but in opposite ways. And that kind of makes sense. When you have a bed that's already irrigated, you're going to have less capture of runoff. But at the same time, you have more cooling and more plant growth. So what do you do? Uh, where we found that kind of balance was in the soil moisture sensor or on-demand irrigation, which proved to be a really uh, good medium. The good news is that in terms of water management, uh, regardless of material configuration, 60% average of the total water is retained, um, which is commensurate with a lot of uh, papers and science uh, out there. Uh, so that's pretty significant. That means that you can uh, assume that's, that green roofs are really effective in terms of water capture and when you're thinking about stormwater management for your sites, they are absolutely uh, uh, incredible instruments for, for aiding in that kind of uh, water management. In terms of peak flow reduction, which is the main aspect, the kind of if a storm has a, a triangle of the peak, what engineers are looking for is that kind of reduction in that volume that's falling at the peak of the storm. And they're looking for that delay um, and so green roofs are essentially what we found was 90% uh, effective in terms of reducing peak flow during storm events. Um, and where things were really different in terms of irrigation is that when you have daily irrigation, you lower the retention capacity to 50%. And when you have on demand, you can have 70%. And that's quite substantial, again, if you're thinking about it at a kind of a regional scale and the kind of volumes of, of uh, rainfall uh, and flood mitigation. Um, as I mentioned, the organic uh, or biologically derived growing media outperformed the mineral aggregate uh, uh, by quite a lot uh, in terms of storm management, uh, thermal cooling, and plant growth, particularly for the biodiverse uh, mix. And then uh, thirdly, that uh, the sedum species, uh, the, the kind of the, the xeric planting, uh, is a top performer in both stormwater management and thermal cooling. And what we thought was that uh, perhaps uh, interception was at play. And so this was actually a surprise to us. We assumed that the grasses and forbs, because they suck up a lot of water and they would evapotranspire, and they also have a large biomass that they would aid in that kind of uh, transporting of water. And, uh, but we were actually, uh, and we also thought it would, it would affect thermal cooling. But in fact, it was really the kind of the cover, the consistent cover that we get with sedum that was the most effective. And so in, in a sense, uh, the city was right by recommending uh, the sedum.
Um, um, but uh, here is the kind of the, the, the uh, dilemma again. So we've got the sedum operating uh, at sort of the, the, the optimal performance for stormwater management and thermal cooling. Um, and we did another study actually that was, that was quite interesting looking at the kind of the, uh, using a leaf parameter, uh, looking at what's the capacity of, the, uh, of the, the actual leaf surface being this kind of a waxy and cup-like structure to hold on to water and just evaporate it off the surface rather than having to infiltrate into the soil and transpire. And that was a kind of a subset uh, study that we did uh, but but we, we showed that that was the case with the sedum and that the main, they really maintain a kind of a, uh, uh, at least a, a minimum of 90% cover. But here's the, here's the, uh, the dilemma here. And, and this is why I was mentioning earlier the question around native, non-native. The sedum are largely, uh, or uh, uh, all of them are non-native to uh, Southern Ontario, only a few species are native to uh, British Columbia, and they didn't survive in the mix that we had in, in Toronto. Now, when we did a kind of a pollinator study, uh, looking, uh, collecting bees and looking at pollen loads off of uh, bees, we looked at the fact that uh, the non-native bees, so these are the domesticated honeybees, gravitated towards the non-native sedum, and the native wild solitary bees gravitated largely towards the um, grasses, the native grasses and forbs. And so the question is if you have, um, and this is maybe a, another kind of important context to bring, Southern Ontario has about 350 known native wild solitary bee species. So these are the kind of bee species that nest in cavities of plants, stems, or they might cavity, or they might um, nest um, in the ground. In fact, two thirds uh, of those 350 species nest in the ground. So think about all the kind of impervious paved surfaces and what we've done to our urban regions in getting rid of, uh, of, of these kinds of uh, bee species. Um, but this is a, a, a kind of a big question around if we are prioritizing the non-native uh, sedum, if 90% of roofs are, are uh, actually planted with sedum, are we providing the kind of the uh, 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 priority ecological habitat and out-competing the native uh, wild bee species? And studies have really shown the kind of the correlation between pollination and ecological integrity and pollination and vice versa. When you have a loss of, of ecological cover, you lose bee species and so on and so forth. So that's a, that's a, 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 a real uh, sort of ecological uh, crisis. The other is looking at uh, building heights and pollinators. Is there a correlation? Uh, given the fact that there is a kind of a mandate for pollinator habitat in the city of Toronto and that there's a mandate for biodiverse, increasing biodiversity. Um, and that the reality is that uh, all of the new builds in Toronto are um, 40, 60, 100 uh, uh, floors or stories up. Are the bees actually going up there? And the answer is no. And what we found was uh, when we did a kind of a survey of, um, of over 30 roofs, that there's a certain cutoff around eight stories. And that makes sense because that's really the height of tree canopy and that bee visitation uh, is really seldom at uh, elevations uh, above that. So the question is, are we really designing for biodiversity at the 60th story? And the answer is uh, no. Um, and so um, I wanted to just maybe conclude with uh, a few sort of thoughts around uh, the principles, research principles around uh, uh, research into living green infrastructure. And the first begins with a kind of this, this sort of question around uh, empirical research. And, and when you're dealing with the, these really complex biotic and abiotic uh, 
systems, uh, it's, it's really imperative to have these kind of experimental and uh, empirical data that are regionally uh, localized and nuanced uh, to understand uh, the kind of the, the metrics that are really relevant to a particular region. And that is not only the kind of the ecological uh, and the climatological, but also the infrastructural. Uh, in Toronto, we have combined storm sewer. And so when you're dealing with these kinds of flood issues, you're dealing with the, the fact that uh, most of the uh, storm drains will back up with uh, sewage into water bodies. In other cities where that's maybe not an issue and uh, uh, water conservation or drought is an issue, other kind of aspects will come into play in terms of uh, the, the kind of the motivations for these, uh, for these uh, green infrastructure uh, technologies. Um, and what we've learned is that the, the kind of the necessity on a, on a city level is the need for a more complex decision-making tools that would allow uh, to establish the kind of not, not only the performance benchmarks, but also that uh, the idea of, of what, uh, what uh, performance might you uh, even want to achieve in any given uh, area or property. Not all green roofs are created equal, and nor should they be. Uh, in other words, if you are on the 60th floor, uh, you're not really designing for biodiversity. Maybe you're designing for stormwater management and thermal cooling. But if you're on the uh, sixth level podium of a high rise tower, you might think about a more biodiverse uh, garden and, uh, and so on. Um, and so these are the, uh, the, other, the other sort of principle is the kind of the multi-disciplinary uh, and multi-sectoral uh, partnerships that, uh, that we've developed, the kind of multi-sectoral engagement, influencing and learning from local policies and local practices. And we have a, a, a really large set of partnerships, not only with the city of Toronto, but also with the entire sort of major players in the, in the, green, in, in the green sector to look at what their actual practical know-how in terms of implementing these systems day to day, the kind of the material sourcing, the ecological footprint of material sourcing, and begin to intervene, begin to also uh, bring in that kind of knowledge into the academy so that we're not really working uh, in a vacuum. The third is, uh, is this kind of thought as an academic, what uh, what we could really leverage, and uh, and and this this notion about the campus as a living lab, um, and and thinking about this idea of um, uh, the potential of using the kind of built infrastructure that we have, the buildings and landscape uh, within the university to actually uh, make an impact through the kind of research practice um, that that we engage with. Um, and this was a, an ambition from the University of Toronto uh, with, a, with a, a huge kind of demand from actually from students to divest from, uh, from, the, uh, from the carbon industry. Um, and one of the kind of the, the, the mandates of the, the university is to slowly decarbonize uh, the campus. And so our uh, installation of the solar panels, we worked very closely with the university uh, sustainability office and facilities and services to actually implement the solar installations as part of the grid. So this is a kind of a net meter installation that now offsets the building uh, energy. Uh, more recently, we moved into a new building. And so um, under the wet weather flow policies, uh, most new construction now have an underground cistern uh, with the mandate for all of that water collected being reused in irrigation. And again, there are no empirical studies, no best practices, uh, or the best practices that are out there are really uh, sort of misguided. And here we had the opportunity to think about uh, building a green roof that would reuse uh, the cistern collected stormwater runoff 
and measure it, uh, compare between a cistern collected uh, runoff water with domestic water supply, and currently there are no benchmarks in Toronto for that. Also for water quantity, uh, looking at water quality benchmarks relative to urban pollutants, uh, looking at best practices in site water management, uh, and looking at, at these really interesting things that are emerging around building automated systems um, and adaptive water management. Uh, sensor, the, the kind of the ubiquitous integration of sensor technology into many of our buildings and systems. Can we actually learn uh, in real time and feedback and make uh, changes, of kind of an adaptive management system uh, going forward, and and how do we how do we use these kinds of systems uh, and these technologies uh, in design as a as a feedback loop? Looking at growing media amendments and optimized performance, and um, and and looking at at the kind of the the what makes up the growing media and what's what's out there that we can add uh, to optimize performance and. Uh, again, looking at the cyclical economy, looking at the, the environmental impact of all the materials that are going into these systems and being applied uh, so vastly across urban regions. Um, and so with a, the overall question, uh, uh, and now that's, that's part of the kind of a full site management, looking at connecting not the roof not only as a separate technology, but also as a roof as part of a full site water management system connecting the ground uh, with the roof and looking at the, the uh, post-occupancy post adaptive management. And this is just a shot of a kind of a recent installation looking at the three water sources, the cistern, domestic, and combined uh, cistern and domestic supply for water. Um, and, and then furthermore, uh, here there are two installations. So we've got our new uh, building in the circle um, and our old building just uh, south of it. Uh, but the university is really a single landowner. Uh, uh, just on this campus alone, we have 120 buildings uh, with a vast uh, area that the university manages on its own. Can we look at some of our experimentations as a way to actually transition and act on sustainability and climate change action uh, in retrofitting some of our buildings and combining that with research and experiential learning. And then finally, the kind of the potential on interdisciplinarity and interdisciplinary collaboration. Um, and, and that has been a, a, a real kind of uh, interest of mine in looking at what are the ways to transcend the institutional structures that uh, sort of uh, 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 keep us in our, in our respective disciplines, in our respective buildings, knowing that these issues are really complex and cross-cutting and you have to have a, a range of expertise working together to really figure all these things out. And what are the new models for pedagogy that, that can come out of that? Uh, so just recently, we've landed a, a really large uh, federal grant to start a new program um, that will look at green infrastructure, research and training. Uh, it's a, uh, a national program, so we're uh, combined with four other universities uh, in Canada and eight universities worldwide, uh, ranging from Australia, Japan, France, Israel, uh, the United States, all having uh, all have green infrastructure labs, so students will be able to do exchanges and uh, and so on. And looking at this kind of idea of new interdisciplinary uh, training programs, so the ambition is to have 60 graduate students in the next six years going through this program. Uh, and this is just an aerial view of our of our new roof uh, installations. Um, and with that, some of these topics, uh, so again, working with these kind of industry to look at uh, the, the material sources and the environmental footprint, where are these materials coming from? How are they grown? How far are they transported? What's the R&D around these materials? What are the kind of uh, gaps in terms of the knowledge in terms of uh, material sourcing? And here we are at a nursery where they're uh, growing sedum mats and these vast, 
uh, areas. Um, this is just another uh, image of, uh, of how uh, the growing media is, is uh, pumped up uh, into the roof through these blowers on the roof. So looking at, uh, again, the, the kind of the whole process from, from A to Z. Um, and looking at all the kind of the materials that are involved in the layers and how we can uh, improve uh, that, all the kind of um, uh, components uh, and the technical knowledge that's required uh, to install these. So, so giving our students a real kind of hands-on practical information uh, and experience working with industry and other uh, academic uh, experts visiting uh, a number of, of uh, both successful and failed uh, uh, green infrastructure projects and looking at, at uh, what, uh, what works and what doesn't, um, as well as working together to build instruments to the kind of uh, understand the technology around sensor technology. Um, and then looking at the potential of merging data and aesthetic, and we've been uh, uh, experimenting with a couple of different projects, and, and hopefully that, that will be another kind of uh, set of investigations coming forth. Uh, this is a, an image of how we are uh, recording our, um, uh, just a, a sort of on a week, uh, a bi-weekly basis, we're recording uh, the growth of uh, each test bed, so we have these uh, photographs. Uh, so we decided to do this kind of a, uh, an archive of all the uh, beds uh, over time, which I can show you uh, what it looks like on the internet uh, in a moment. Uh, we do also do these kind of field tests, right? So this is our uh, pin frame where we actually look at uh, percent cover and biomass, counting literally leaves and pin touches, and that forms our statistical data for plant cover, biodiversity, and biomass. Uh, and this is just a shot of the kind of the reams and reams of Excel data of sensor every five minutes recording hydrologic thermal uh, data. Uh, so how do, what do you do with all of that? How do we visually correlate all this so that we can begin to understand that? So we, we played around with uh, Grasshopper to think about a kind of a model that would correlate uh, uh, all of those uh, aspects together. We came up with this uh, model which looks at the inputs uh, of, of water uh, in blue, the, the rainfall, and output, uh, and that's relative to the Toronto standard uh, of 50% uh, retention. Uh, looking at the ambient temperature in red as the kind of the input, and then the cooling effect down below in terms of what's the kind of the cooling above the bed. And then looking at a 360 plant cover, and then the height in tiers of, uh, of biomass, so correlating uh, all of that together. And if uh, I can stop for just one second, uh, if you go to our website, uh, what we have is uh, the ability to actually sort by the uh, design uh, variables um, and then uh, scroll uh, over time, month by month, uh, over a period of six years to look at how the beds did uh, in each period. Um, and then looking at the corollary uh, to that in terms of how they did in terms of performance. So you can sort of go back and forth between some of the uh, beds and uh, the infographics. And we found that that was quite effective in terms of dialoguing with uh, architectural firms with uh, practitioners to really uh, uh, sort of visually hone in on what are the kind of the main uh, gaps in terms of design factors where you can end up with, uh, for instance, with green roots that are absolutely failed uh, all the way and, and just uh, ones that are thriving and what, what would it take? So looking at some of these. 
uh, factors in uh, more visually. The other uh, and, and sort of last project uh, that we're, we were thinking about is the kind of merging between design and biology. And this was a project that we did um, with, uh, uh, with one of my collaborators who's a, a biologist and also a, an expert in bees. Um, and we looked at the, this kind of idea around biomimetic architecture and looking at analog uh, bee habitats. And as I mentioned earlier, we were looking at solitary bee species that are nesting in the cavities of these. And the students uh, that worked with us had done these superb drawings of looking at all these, these uh, plants that, uh, that certain very specific bee taxa are actually nesting in. Uh, and interestingly enough, they have very specific sort of habitat requirements in terms of what's the sheathing material and what's the kind of the nodal gap between, between the nodes of a, of a stem or a stalk and so on and so forth. And so really, really specific translating that into a kind of an architectural habitat requirement looking at very specific uh, bee sizes, bee species, their architectural requirements. On the right here is what my colleague, Scott McIver, the biologist, uh, does in terms of his studies. So this is how we got the kind of the, so it's, for instance, the building elevation to bee visitation study. So he's got the GPS along with what he calls the bee hotel. So this is what he implements. And this is what our students came up with together when we worked together. So this is looking at um, uh, one of the bee uh, species, which uh, the Megachile relativa, um, and looking at the kind of the uh, this this notion that you would design for disassembly. You would get this kit, kind of be this laser cut, uh, arrive at your home uh, flat. Uh, you could assemble it, uh, look at, at these kind of installations that are both aesthetic and experimental. Um, you, can, you can then collect the bees that are uh, nested in it, uh, look at them in terms of the kind of the, the science uh, study or questions that you have, and then, and then install them uh, out again. Uh, this was another example uh, looking at uh, science that actually doesn't exist in terms of what bees prefer in terms of the solar orientation of where they're nesting, and there, there's really no science around that. So this was a, uh, a design for a fence uh, for, uh, for the same uh, bee, the megachile, uh, looking at the kind of idea that this would, uh, that the bee would uh, nest in the cavities and there would be this kind of a solar study on uh, that would be experimental because it would be replicated across the fence. So looking at these kind of um, experimental design principles that I mentioned before, the replication, the kind of the research questions and how they might inform design ideas and design practice and design detailing. And then the last example uh, is the, um, uh, is the, is the uh, carpenter bee, which likes to nest and burrow in under decks and in wood. And this was an idea to combine um, these kind of uh, nesting structures uh, on top of uh, highway barriers or these kind of sound barriers that are uh, hideous and concrete uh, and have this kind of a more aesthetic uh, combination of um, and also this, this uh, uh, opportunity for habitat and for an experimental design. So I'll uh, conclude with that and I'd be happy to um, take your questions. Thank you. I'm not sure if you, um, sorry. sorry? 
here. Uh, that would be nice. Uh, th this might be a question for uh, for the dean. If there if there are lectures every Wednesday. Not every Wednesday, but uh, looks on the website. Um, it's a really good question, and I, it's something that I often wrestle with, right? Because uh, there's so much science that takes place that I'm not a part of, right? And you, you sort of uh, ask yourself, what's my role in, in all of this? Uh, I think one of the sort of the, the big things I think that uh, I would say um, that um, this kind of... Uh, um, bringing all the, the sciences together is uh, really unique. And I would say that it, if it weren't for a landscape architect doing it, it wouldn't necessarily happen. Because the corollary labs that we're in touch with and that, that you read uh, about or you read their science are often happening, they're, they're happening within their own respective disciplines. So they would happen in engineering, but they would only look at the kind of the thermal performance, or they might look at the water, uh, or they might look at just the, the kind of the biological factors, but they're not always looking at the, uh, all of those together. And so these scientists and engineers uh, wouldn't have been talking to one another uh, in a way, if I didn't, if I didn't bring them together, and it's this kind of, uh, I think also, uh, it's making them ask questions now that are out, that are outside of their own domains, that are pushing their way. For instance, the study that I mentioned around the, uh, the kind of the using the leaf parameter to look at the, uh, the. Um, role that plants have in water management in terms of their surfaces, their evapotranspirative uh, behavior and so on. That was actually taken, undertaken by the engineering professor who studies, you know, subsurface water, you know, uh, science and not at all thinking about plants, you know. So, so I think the, the kind of the idea that um, I have set up this lab that really necessitates cross-disciplinary conversation and also cross-sectoral conversations because they, they bring in different industries and different, different policies that are also not necessarily thought about by, this, by the same divisions, right? So the water policies are under... Toronto water and they're largely developed by engineers the biodiversity and all the pollinators they're under the environment division and so they're not really talking to one another and I think that that landscape architecture has an enormous role in convening the kind of conversations because we are thinking about all these issues really synthetically we are thinking about the multifunctionality of all, all of these things at the same time and we are interested in, in where the gaps are. We're interested in the kind of the conflicts or the synergies or uh, the kind of the potential for innovation, uh, both in terms of the, the, the technologies themselves, the designs themselves, but also the process of working. So I think that that's a really important piece. Maybe, maybe sort of it's understated in a sense because they're... There's so much sort of behind the scene and just orchestrating the conversation, 
and the experimental setup to actually just happen. Uh, but it's convening all those uh, people that I think is, uh, you know, a really important role as a landscape architect that I think would, would not have happened in the same way if it were just coming in from uh, a biology department or, or an engineering department. So I, I don't know if this answers your question, but I think that that's, that's in a way that's kind of, I know that the design projects kind of, they're, they're more sort of, Soluble. I mean, they're they're more sort of tangible in in terms of how the disciplines come together, visually or aesthetically. But I think what's been more impactful is the mobilization of entire departments and sectors to come together and now influencing the entire set field. Uh, you know, from designers to manufacturers to policymakers to make a change and change the policy to a different direction. And I think that's where I've been kind of, I guess that's how I've been seeing my role. I mean, it's still, you know, we, we still operate within a professional, professionally accredited program, right? So most of our core programming is, um, is uh, uh, limited to, uh, to what we're teaching in terms of our core courses and so on and so forth. And so all these students are participating over the summer and then, you know, sort of part-time throughout the year as research assistants. And so it's it's still a kind of a, a a difficult jump towards making this kind of a program a fully integrated, interdisciplinary um, program that's that is a standalone that is actually a a full degree or something like that. But I think that it's the emergence of it. I think that what what we will see in the next few years is this kind of a transdisciplinary effort um, <clears throat> in parallel what's happening at the University of Toronto just a year ago <clears throat> uh, the School of Cities was formed and uh, <clears throat> it's a fully transdisciplinary educational unit that is a standalone so it's a school and its sole mandate is to do transdisciplinary research on cities so it's not interested in faculty members in continuing their own discrete research on cities. They're saying you can do that on your own. Here you're coming in and you're actually only doing, developing transdisciplinary methodologies. So it's emerging, but we're not there yet. I think we're at the kind of the cusp of really changing pedagogy, uh, you know, towards that. But but there, there are lots of obstacles. I think they're, you know, the, the kind of the, the disciplinary requirements for degrees and so on and so forth and the fact that they have different criteria for evaluation these come in the way so currently as it stands it's a it's a um still follows these kinds of it still operates within those within within those boundaries but it's trying to now form its own uh direction so it, it will form its own kind of uh maybe new hybrid uh, new hybrid degree. Oh, yeah. Um, yes, thank you for asking about that. Uh, yeah, Nikibi Dawadina Gigwag, uh, which is an Anishinaabe Moen. Uh, language. So it's one of the First Nations uh, uh, languages, uh, predominant languages in Canada and in parts of North America. Uh, and uh, it means flooded valley healing. And this was uh, something that was uh, a, a, a naming that was um, that was done as a ceremony. It's an Indigenous youth program um, that um, I co-started two years ago, 
um, with an elder, with an Anishinaabe elder, a First Nations elder, um, and a couple of other collaborators who are in the environmental sector. And the idea was to start a, um, an access program, uh, which would be a pathway for post-secondary education uh, for indigenous high school students um, on green infrastructure. So building on this and building on this idea of this kind of uh, merging design and science, merging environmental science and design and landscape architecture and architecture, sustainable sustainability, but also uh, bringing in uh, the kind of cultural um, and spiritual dimensions of, um, of First Nations teachings. Um, and we saw a lot of affinity in that, uh, in these kind of thinking, because um, uh, because the, the main laws of, of First Nations uh, civilizations and cultures are natural laws. Uh, and environmental protection and land defending, land and water defending, uh, are part of their legal system uh, and their entire kind of spiritual, cognitive, uh, and identity. Uh, so, so we're, we we saw a lot of a lot of affinity, although we're really speaking very different languages, not not only literally but but also conceptually. Uh, and so that's that's been a really interesting uh, project. It's uh, as I said, it's an access program, but it's also an employment program. So the youth are employed with the environmental organization um, that we're partnered with. They're working for seven weeks in the summer on environmental conservation field work. Um, so not dissimilar from you know green roofs is just a little part of it, but the, all the ravine lands and all of that, uh, they're doing uh, landscape, they're trained in, in landscape architecture, all, all sorts of different kind of um, entry points into thinking how, how one might think about uh, landscape architecture at a regional scale or a small scale. We're doing design projects. And there's also all the cultural teachings with elders and knowledge keepers, and all of them are sort of interwoven uh, together. So it's a, it's a very intense, uh, and it's been a really uh, amazing um, kind of project. I, I was, uh, uh, you know, I thought about incorporating some of that, but it was just, it's a, it's a really big topic, and I also didn't uh, um, feel um, that it would be just for me to talk about it without the elder uh, here. So uh, hopefully I'll get another chance and, and, and we'll do that again. But thank you for, for bringing that up. It's a really good question. I'd say it's a really kind of slow moving turn. It's you know it's 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 really changing. Like I said, ninety percent of the installations follow follow a certain direction, and so making that uh, shift uh, is 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 you know it, it's taking a long time uh, for us to to raise that kind of awareness. Um, and there is a there there's still a huge divide because what's what's really ruling the 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 game is the industry. The industry is what's dictating what's actually being specified. 
uh, it's the industry that are going to offices and are saying, here, that's what you need to put out there. That's what's out there and that's what, what it is. And so when I speak to designers and firms, we do a lot of tours, we do a lot of presentations. Um, I, I have a lot of uh, architects and landscape architects that, that say, I didn't know I can ask for something different. I didn't know I can specify something else. I, 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 you know, I thought it was a set uh, sort of product. Um, and so th that sort of debunking a lot of these myths is, has been a, a really big project. Uh, there's a lot of debunking that we need to do, a lot of myths that are out there around organics, for instance, that are, um, there's a huge aversion to organics because of, there's a, there's a kind of an, an idea that, that they discharge a lot of effluent of phosphorus and nitrogen causing eutrophication in water bodies and so on and so forth. But when we did a study uh, uh, like that, we basically proved that the dis even if you covered all of Toronto with green roofs with the organic soil, you would still get an infinitesimal fraction of, of a uh, nutrient discharging into the water relative to the wastewater treatment plants that are, that are flowing directly into Lake Ontario. And, and that most landscapes are not at all vilified or held accountable for fertilizers. So there is a huge kind of uh, misunderstanding around these things. And again, we have to, you know, take, take these issues to design firms and to industry and to po the policy into the city of Toronto and say, okay, let's start from the beginning <laughs> and rethink all of that. But it's a really, it's a huge, um, it's taking a long time for these things uh, to change. And hopefully with this new green roof, uh, sorry, green infrastructure training program, one of the things that uh, uh, will be part of it is an annual conference for the next six years. Uh, where we can bring in all these people together and have uh, more of these kind of conversations. So hopefully more impact uh, in that direction. And to your, to your second question around, uh, around sensors, uh, that's not, not quite happening yet. So I think that's, again, that's, that, that'll be interesting. Um, sidewalk labs are in Toronto now. So they're now a, one of our partners in this green infrastructure program. Uh, so that's an, another, you know, we're on the cusp of that, I think, in terms of integrated uh, computing. The, the whole uh, uh, Villiers Island off of Toronto is now going to be designed by Sidewalk Lab. So the whole thing is going to be censored. So that's Google. Uh, you know, a lot of contention there around privacy and so on and so forth. But, it, but, but we actually consulted to them around this idea of monitoring environmental performance in the landscape. Uh, and so on. So I think it's 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 still emerging, uh, but not quite quite yet in terms of full uh, or even partial adoption. But good question. Great questions. Um, so for, for the first one, I think, I mean, that would be an amazing uh, 
it, it, I'd say it's more of a statement from, from, from you rather than a question, that, which I fully agree with. I think that would be an amazing um, research to undertake, maybe something for the School of Cities uh, kind of uh, collaboration in terms of thinking about equity and, and green infrastructure and, and what are the kind of uh, p political mechanisms uh, and prioritization around incentives uh, and, and where efforts are being made towards the implementation of green infrastructure. Uh, because all the reds that you saw in the heat map, uh, some of them are industrial areas, but some of them are just um, uh, low income uh, apartment buildings with parking lots. And these are, are you know, uh, certainly uh, sort of ecological deserts, uh, they're also food deserts. And so there, there, there are a lot of um, uh, aspects that could be sort of uh, packaged together, uh, you know, looking at a number of different, again, you know, you know when things are looking at in silos, when the, when the questions around equity or question around, around access to uh, uh, green or, you know, issues around health or issues around Poverty and food security, which are largely these red areas that are that are uh, you know in in, in Toronto, uh, you know, can they be merged together with a kind of uh, incentive around ecosystem services for stormwater management? Like these are not necessarily thought about together because they're separate uh, separate departments. So. Um, I, I think that would be an, an amazing project to undertake and to, to really think about um, not not only making these kind of technologies a mandate or a or a sort of a an overall sort of hey these are good things to do, but to be a mu much more strategic around their implementation uh, relative to the kinds of needs and and. Uh, um, and priorities of the cities on a social level and also on an environmental uh, level. Um, and uh, sorry, what was your second question? Remind me. Oh, so okay. So intensive roofs are are technically they're deeper roofs, um, and and so they you know they would allow for. Um, the growth of, let's say, small trees or shrubs and, and things of that nature. Um, uh, so a couple of things around that. We have focused our research on sort of following what's happening in terms of prevalent industry practices. Um, because this is where w w where we want to make the most impact is where the impact is, right? Because it's it's just massive amounts of materials that are being applied out there, and so we want to get get into the, the these ideas around like where you know uh, how can we how can we sort of improve the the or or, or elevate the practices that are that are out there there to um, reduce the environmental impact? Um, and in fact, the industry is going into what we call "how low can you go?" <laughs> They're going thinner, and so actually, we're going thinner too. We're thinking, okay, how do you, how do you actually make these technologies sort of super performers by making them? Even thinner, and what are the and so we we are looking into right now biochar amendments and stuff like that, and and, and all sorts of different interesting things like that. Um, so so that's on one thing around depth, and then there's another aspect of depth depth, which is weight. Um, so the 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 balance there is load capacity, and how much then you need in terms of environmental cost to reinforce your building, to have more weight on the roof? And are you getting enough environmental benefits from that depth to offset the environmental costs in what all the materials that you put in into your building? And I don't have an answer to that, but it's a question that one should ask when they are increasing the depth of the soil. There's also interesting ideas around where you already have load-bearing capacities, columns, and so on. 
you can actually deepen your depth. And so the roof doesn't have to be all one depth. It could actually have micro topographies. And that's an interesting thing from an ecological level because you can have wet and dry. You can have all sorts of different ideas around planting that rather than a carpet, rather than one, uh, one depth. And I think you had a, a question around aesthetics. And what I would say to that is, so we haven't, you know, I haven't really presented that, that aspect because we've been so focused on the kind of the, the environmental performances that have justified the implementation or the legislation of these green, green systems, which are, you know, the water management and the heat and all of that kind of stuff. But um, I would say that given the B research that we did in terms of building elevation, where I would put the most emphasis in terms of making it more of a garden that's actually accessible is at the lower levels um, where you can actually combine the kind of the uh, social benefits of being in a garden, in a, in a rooftop garden, and then also then get the, uh, the kind of the environmental co-benefits um, along with that. So, um, so again, thinking about the sort of the city three-dimensionally rather than a one, one size fits all uh, that you implement um, a, like one kind of green roof anywhere, but rather thinking about a green roof at one elevation could be one thing, uh, a green roof at another elevation could be another thing, and in relationship with the architectural structure and the loading capacity, you can do really creative things. I hope that answers your question. Thank you.